Hi everyone, Kieran here. Today I have something crazy to show you. I want to show you how to run Python code in your browser without any, you know, server side or anything. It's just running pure Python code directly in your browser. So how does it work? So maybe you heard about this um, relatively new uh, programming feature, uh, which is called WebAssembly. Have you heard about WebAssembly? Maybe not. So it's it's pretty experimental right now, but it's really you know coming up in and supported in all the major browsers. So let me show you. Basically, Web WebAssembly is a, a binary instruction format. So you compile something to binary, and then you can load it into your JavaScript virtual machine. So it basically allows you to run any not any, but mostly C, C++ code. You compile it to some binary format and then you can load it directly, safely in your browser. So if it seems a bit crazy to you, you may want be wondering why would I ever use that? Think about all the, the, the money that has been spent, the billions of dollars that have been spent developing low level libraries, very efficient libraries such as math library, like scientific computation, games, uh, you know, compression algorithm, machine learning and everything. It would be very, very uh, costly and frankly not very efficient to try to reinvent the wheel once again in JavaScript. So it's actually cheaper to create um, some kind of layer that translates one format, one code, one programming language to another one so that you can basically reuse all the libraries that we have already. So um, let me give you an example. Say, okay, what can we do with WebAssembly? I've just run here. This is a Doom 3 demo, right? So as you can see, it's it's I'm in the game. And I can you know I can punch. I can go around and, and everything. And this is loaded in real time in my browser. So if I you know just quit here and reload the page, it will actually load uh, the game, the real game as it was developed back in the day in 2004, I think, and on Windows directly in my browser. So I'm downloading the game and running it, you know, at 60 frames per second. So very smooth uh, game uh, directly here in my browser. So it, it's really, really, really impressive. If you think of what you can do, it's, I know it's a bit crazy, right? But uh, I think it's still very, very impressive. So in our case here, uh, yeah, as you can see, it's the real game, right? With the, the sound, the textures and everything. And so maybe you're not aware of this, but this technology is already used uh, by major players such as Google or like Figma and, and Miro and other uh, software like this. So they try to port and more and more actually porting core part of the application uh, you know, to be uh, run in different programming language and then compiling it to uh, WASM, what it's called, so WebAssembly and run, like loading it in, in JavaScript. So this was just one, uh, yeah, an example, a full demo, right? With the game, you have the sound and everything. You have the, the console, uh, you know, I'm going back in the game here. Uh, so yeah, this is one one example of this. Now let's try to uh, look another, uh, you know, thing we could do with WebAssembly. And in our case, I'm really focusing on, on Python, especially for scientists or, you know, uh, you know, people that have uh, experience in programming languages. Maybe you, you know, you have experience in Python, you know how to do some simple scripts. Uh, but it's um, too much of a hassle to learn how to code in JavaScript for now. So you want a quick and easy way to you know get things done, and uh, maybe Python may be the way to do it. And I'm really thinking for scientists here. Uh, as you may know, I work in a university, and um, uh, sometimes you have very like um, you know deep uh, computational task that can only be you know run on very uh, optimized uh, hardware, and it's actually you don't have you cannot find any JavaScript library to replace what already exists in C, for instance. And uh, so the cool thing with Python is that you can bind, right? It's a, it's a glue language so that you, you actually type Python, but underneath it, it calls very optimized libraries. So this is uh, something that we're gonna try to, uh, to do here. So let me try to uh, just uh, quit here and uh, talk about this uh, example that I'm gonna show you. So this is what you see here. Right, so I'm in cables, I'm always in cables and I'm actually made some uh, nodes that we can use to basically run any Python code in cables. But just I want to show you, so the points that you see here are obviously uh, created in WebGL, so JavaScript based, but the, the whole data processing is uh, made with Python. 
So we talked about WebAssembly and, uh, and now let's talk about how to actually run Python in JavaScript. It, we use what the Pyodide uh, framework, which is basically yeah, the whole scientific stack. So it's not only pure Python, it's, you have also 75 other packages such as NumPy, Pandas, even some plotting, charting libraries, Matplotlib. You can do maybe the machine learning. Everything is ported into one uh, WebAssembly you know, bi binary that you load dynamically. And with that, then you can run some Python code. So if we were to uh, recap, let me try to uh, create a diagram here. So we have Python code, right? Python code, which is uses this uh, PyODide framework, which transforms to which basically uh, is compiled with the WebAssembly using this compiler, which is called Enscripten, which is, was originally developed by Mozilla, Enscripten, which produces um, the WASM binary format, which is then loaded by the JavaScript engine which we wrapped into this cables, cables, GL framework. So it's a bit crazy, right? This, the, the stack is, it's, it's really like an experimental demo, but it's actually uh, working uh, extremely well. So I think it was uh, worth a shot. So you can, I will put the links to all of what I'm talking about here below with all the links to just WebAssembly, the mscript and compiler that transformed the CC++ and the C Python implementation into the, this binary format. And then this project, which actually also creates some bindings so that you can load, you know, and talk to Python and get some variables out of Python, but also from Python access some JavaScript variables. So it's really, uh, you know, uh, a complete binding and two bidirectional uh, exchange of information, right? So um, let's go back to, to our um, uh, cables project and let me show you how it works. So basically the project that I have here, I've tried to extract from my Spotify playlist. So I'm using this website to export my playlist and try to get uh, how many artists are being repeated in my uh, playlist. So maybe you have a playlist like this. I'm a huge uh, salsa music fan. So I have this uh, playlist that I've curated. And with this website here, I can basically uh, go and export any of my playlists. So you just go there, you log with your Spotify account, and then you can yeah, you have access to your playlist. Some are private, some are public. So I use this one and then you just click export and you get uh, um, a CSV file that we already talked about. So in cables, when you have a CSV file, um, it basically, when you import it into the project here, so you can just drag and drop stuff, it will automatically convert it as a JSON file. So that's easier to load by JavaScript. But instead of using the JSON uh, file that has been converted, I want to show you how we can directly load the CSV file and use you know, pandas. So if you come from the Python world, you, you know this, this library, this very famous uh, data frame library that allows you to do some all kinds of operation, you know, read some data, filter them, group by, and try to you know, manipulate and reshape the data directly from the CSV. So how does it work? Uh, basically, we just load the, the Pyodide uh, framework, which is a very small file, but that automatically loads the whole you know, compiled binary. So it takes a bit of a while to, to get started. And we can actually see in the console here what's happening. And, and you see that, that the, we actually have access to the full Python con console here that has an output. And then we see that we are loading some NumPy libraries and pandas and everything. So. Um, we are here, right? We just uh, we just get started. We have this main loop, and here we uh, request our file. So we basically load our file from uh, the cables patch. You can actually load uh, from you know a, a CSV file that that is hosted on GitHub, for instance. Okay, now what we do here, the, the trick, is, the main node is this one, right? Once we started and we have this Pyodide framework uh, in our cables environment. The node that I've created was really this one, run Python, which has uh, like five parameters. 
uh, one to, to execute it. So once it's loaded, then you can run the code, right? You cannot run Python before the library is loaded, but check this out. You, once you, you pass the reference to the Pyodine main object, so okay, that's fine. And then you have this Python code that you can edit and some extra parameters that you can actually pass to Python. So first let's, let's let inspect this one and check the code. So if you know Python, you should be very familiar with this. Import NumPy, which is the, the main, uh, uh, you know, um, scientific, uh, like low level math, uh, you know, primitives for arrays, matrices, and everything. And as you can see, I'm really like running Python code. So I've created different variables, you know, X, Y, N, Z, and K with different types. One is a number, one is an array, one is a matrix that we convert back to arrays, one is a string, and one is an object. And I wanted to show you that, so this is the code that you will write, like completely interactively, right? If I can put here, I put I don't know, 15 and I save, then as you can see, it's being rerun. And now with those objects, I can actually get back the number. So I'm asking for the variable X and it gives me back 15, showing you that I went from the Python land to the JavaScript land very easily, just like that. I, you know, in similar fashion, I can get my Z variable and I get the string back. And these operators also tells you, uh, they tell you if the, you know, it's valid or not. So you make sure that you're actually reading uh, correct data from Python. As I had showed you, you can also, you know, pass array and get back arrays uh, and even arrays of arrays, right? So here's a nice inspector. I'm on the dev version. So we have the access to this uh, uh, nice uh, array inspector. But uh, if you use the regular um, uh, cables, um, you will also see them in a bit differently. It's coming out very uh, no, in a few weeks, so probably you will, you would see that in the regular cables when the video uh, you know um, uh, comes out. Then we have this uh, flatten array. So as you can see, I'm actually reading back my matrix of three by four, which is like 11, uh, 12 values all of once. And it's to make sure we can go back to the code here and check. We're asking for NumPy to create an array of arrays, if you wish, with three arrays of each containing four values, and they are ones. So I'm actually reading back a matrix, uh, a matrix which has been flattened to an array from NumPy. So from there, I can do anything. If I can do some, you know, uh, fast Fourier transform, do some math inversion matrices, you know, finding some all the linear al algebra stuff that you can think of. All the like, you know, the I don't know, thousands of functions that you can, you can play with in all the NumPy, SciPy, Scikit-Learn, all the Python packages that uh, most of you are very familiar with if you come from the, you know, data science, uh, machine learning world in Python. So this is very cool, uh, and you know, my whole objective in in allowing people using cables to have Python directly in cables is to you know, ease the pain from transitioning to, you know, backend machine learning a background to, you know, data art and do something more interactive and more visual, uh, you know, with the tools that you already know. So my goal here was to show you how you can process data, uh, you know, in Python, and then, you know, just learn the bit of blocks you need in cables to uh, make it, you know, interactive in 3D and have colors and everything. So no, going back to our playlist, that we load. So we have the CSV file. And instead of transforming into a JSON file, as you have by default, I'm just requesting it to be regular text, right? Or plain, uh, you know, text file, CSV file, exactly as you, if, as you would have if you opened it in your uh, browser, in your computer, right? So I have this, this, uh, this data here and I can inspect it, right? And it comes really as a string with the, all the different, uh, uh, Spotify variables, like right? the, the URL of the track, so the identifier of the track, the track name, the artist, um, and uh, yeah, the album, uh, the, when you know, it was published, and so forth. So I have this data, and now what I'm doing is I'm actually passing this to my Python, because you know, I have it in the um, JavaScript world, and the only drawback that you can really not really do with Python in this sandboxed environment is you cannot really call any you know, uh, networking function. So you cannot load directly from the network inside of Python. You need to go through JavaScript first. And this is for security reasons so that you can, otherwise you would be able to load, you know, some compiled code. You have no idea what it does. You load it on your JavaScript uh, and then it goes back to, you know, some servers and or whatever, right? So you have no control of uh, what it really does. But here, 
you have you have to go if you have any networking functions you have to go through uh, the, the the JavaScript program so you know and you can inspect them here. Now you get the, the the data back and I'm basically creating a new object and I'm setting a key that I call data. This is completely uh, you know uh, random. I could pull it uh, you know any name I want. I'm just setting this to be data. So now by by creating this just this regular JavaScript object, right? Data with the the, the string because it's just reading uh, the whole CSV as a string. Um, if I put this here in my run Python code and up, I would actually set a variable called data and then I can use it from Python. So now let's let's inspect this Python code. And as you can see, um, hopefully, so I'm gonna make, make it maybe bigger, right? Um, can you see that? Yes, right? So I'm importing pandas as regular uh, panda stuff. This is just a way to import, uh, to, to be able to read the string as a file because panda usually you know, reads from a file. And then I'm, I'm just using this read CSV function that already exists in pandas, right? And I'm getting back this data frame. And you see that the data variable is not being declared anything here, uh, like anywhere here, because it comes from the Python, the JavaScript realm. So I'm reading back this data frame and I'm doing some, you know, usual uh, um, data frame operation. So I'm grouping by artist. I have different artists for each track, right? And I'm grouping by artist. And here I'm counting how many times each artist has been, uh, you know, appears in my playlist. And I'm getting back the value and then I'm sorting them so that we have the most uh, repeated artist first. So from by descending value, the, the count, which is the highest, comes first. And then the, the bottom of the array is the lowest value. Then I'm just uh, extracting the name of the artist and how many times, you know, how, how many songs per artist as two different arrays. So I've, I'm just setting two different variables, artist and count. Now from my other nodes, I can actually, you know, get back here the artists. And I'm getting back here the, um, all the artists of the playlist. And here, how many times each artist is being repeated in the playlist. So we see that most of them are actually repeated only once, but we have some key artists like 14 times. So I'm really liking this. Uh, I think it's uh, uh, Gran Combo. Yes, Gran Combo de Puerto Rico. Sorry for my uh, Spanish accent. I don't speak Spanish, which is a very famous band actually. Ray Barreto, maybe you guys know him. Like it's very famous Latin music. So from that, what I do is just, you know, uh, running some kind of um, uh, data mapping. So I'm transforming the number of counts to colors. It's exactly the, the video that I already put out, the tutorial that already exists. So I'm getting this color map and I'm, you know, finding the maximum value of this array. So 14 times and one time. I'm mapping this back to the number of um, colors that I have in my color map. Or this is already covered in previous videos just to, to repeat. And I'm basically creating this color array that I'm setting and, and, and what you see here, I just put random positions, but I try to put forward the, the, the values that are the most uh, repeated. I just try to add them so they, they are a bit forward, but it's completely random. It doesn't really matter here, just to, to showcase how we can take from data from Python and going back to, to the cables RAM. So you notice that we didn't code any JavaScript here. So if you come from Python, you can actually you know, be comfortable in manipulating your data and then try to learn cables to uh, make you know something like this visual or we do the meta mission sensor so we basically create one circle for each artist and then we map the color of each circle uh, by uh, taking back the number of times it, uh, it's an artist is being repeated in the playlist so I hope that this video was uh, informative. I know it's a bit, it's experimental, but I think it's really interesting because a lot of money is being put in creating this kind of WebAssembly uh, tools. And I'm, I'm, in the future, it really is going to be not only JavaScript uh, in the browser anymore, it's going to be a composition of having this JavaScript, but also being able to call other programming languages such as C, C++, Python, Rust. And so basically most of what LL, uh, you know, the, the compiler, uh, Clang, or like uh, LLDB, like if you're not familiar with this, I'll invite you to read the whole um, uh, mscript uh, page. But basically, LLVM, which is a, a big compiler, you know, so that can take tons of different languages. There is there is a way in theory to port them to the web. 
So if you come from even Haskell, I think you could uh, basically, you know, call in your favorite programming language and compose so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel, especially if you have heavy applications. So of course, this whole approach doesn't really make sense if you just want to call two functions. But if you want to do something like, as I, as I was mentioning, doing like some fast Fourier transform, uh, well, uh, it's, you will not need to, and you want it to be optimized and everything. It's, or you have a very big program that you need to port or legacy code and everything. It may actually be better to just uh, run it very fast as a you know, uh, binary, compiled binary, than having to reinvent the wheel and have a less optimized uh, version. So I hope this video was informative. Uh, let me know in the comments if you want to explore, you know, if you feel like compelled to, not compelled, but you know, if you like to, you know, try to investigate this kind of experimental stuff, I can do, I have more crazies, um, crazy videos to, uh, to shoot, uh, you know, mixing, bridging technologies and, you know, uh, pushing it to the limits. But I think it's really interesting as, as, as a geek or nerd, a programming language nerd, I think, uh, um, you know, th there's a lot of room to explore and to be creative in. So that's all for you guys. I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.